welcome to uh, Framestore's webinar with Escape Studios. I think that the plan is just to start the evening by doing a very brief introduction to Framestore and to ourselves. We'll have a bit of a chat up here, I'll ask the guys some questions, um, and once I've run out of questions to ask them, we'll open the floor and let you guys ask questions to us. So just to introduce ourselves, I'm Amy, I'm the Head of Recruitment at Framestore. So if you want a job at Framestore, you've got to come through me. Um, and then with me today, I've got two of our heads of department. Um, we've chosen two of the departments that perhaps people are less familiar with or get less talked about because um, we thought it was a good opportunity to show the range of different um, careers that are available in this industry. So you've got uh, Freddie here next to me. Freddie is the head of our environments team. And then you've got Carl on the end, and Carl is the head of our creature effects team. Uh, so Framestore has been around for about 30 years now. Um, we started out doing largely music videos and commercials. Uh, in fact, one of our first uh, music videos was AHA's Take On Me video, for anyone who's familiar with that. Um, and in the early 90s, we got into film and TV visual effects work, um, largely with the advent of the Harry Potter films. Um, that's what really caused a boom in visual effects in Soho in general. Um, and since then, uh, we've grown to a company now of just over 1,200 people. We have our original office in London where we still do both film and commercials work, but we also have offices in LA, New York, and Montreal. Um, as well as the visual effects work that we're known for, um, we actually consider ourselves now more of a creative studio. Um, we produce digital content across every platform. So that could be a cinema screen, but it could be an installation, it could be a VR headset, it could be a mobile screen, uh, it could be any number of screens, and we produce content for them all. Um, largely tonight we're here to talk about film, just because it is still the largest part of our business. We probably have, of the 1,200 people, about 800 of those are in film. Um, and Freddie and Carl are both from the film department. I thought I'd start by asking you both what you studied at school slash university, whatever it was you did, and how that either prepared you or didn't in any way prepare you for the jobs that you do now. So, Carl, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, mine, mine didn't in any way prepare me. Um, I actually started as an archaeologist, so I, my initial degree was in archaeology. Um, I worked in field archaeology for a while. I then took a master's in archaeology uh, up in York and did. I then worked in archaeology and sort of building conservation for about five or six years. So had no uh, no plans at that stage for this sort of thing as a career. Um, and in fact, back then it, it kind of didn't exist. You know, when I was when I was at university a very long time ago, um, you know that these sort of courses just didn't exist. Um, I'd always loved movies. I grew up with obviously with Star Wars, with Indiana Jones, which you know, influenced my archaeology choice, it has to be said. Um, and at some stage along the line, I sort of thought, well, I'd quite like to do something a bit creative. Even at that point, it still wasn't film. It was just thought maybe some sort of illustration or just anything a bit more creative than what I was doing. Um, yeah, and then I discovered 3D Studio. It was a very, uh, it was a course at a college. And that was a very early version of 3D Studio, not even 3D Max it is now. Um, yeah, and that kind of hooked my interest and it sort of took off from there. Okay. And what about you, Freddie? It's a bit similar, actually. At the beginning, I was an um, analyst programmer, so I was doing some program on the internet, mainly for website. And a bit like you, at some point, I wanted to do something a bit more creative, basically, than just some code over the day. Uh, and I had the opportunity to join a school, it was a bit later, so it was easier, if I can say this. And, um, um, when I started, I started on something really, really with a generalistic approach about everything. So I started to learn everything, even how to take a picture, modeling, everything over two years. And after I had the opportunity to go in Paris directly, uh, where I've been in commercial. Uh, I've done a lot, a lot of work, but quickly I've been uh, responsible about the full floor of commercial uh, movies. Uh, it was interesting, but it's a lot of pressure. Uh, so it was good to learn quickly how to do a picture quickly. Uh, and after I'd been on set, I was supervisor at some point. Then, uh, because of this, I had the opportunity to go to Framestore, uh, where I started to learn how to finish a picture. Basically, it was a big difference because you need to be more organized, to take time to slowly, step by step, 
finish a picture. It was new for me, so it's a different kind of school again, but uh, it was really interesting, and now I am here since, since there. Okay. And Carl, so from doing a course in 3D Studio, how did your career progress from there? How did you end up here? So that was after, after that course, which was a very short, you know, just like a term course I did at uh, sort of Education College. It kind of sparked my interest, so I invested in a copy of Lightwave, which was again in its sort of earliest, one of its earliest incarnations back then. Um, and just spent a few years teaching myself, really, and um, I got a, I'm sure I got a book from somewhere, and just literally just sat and played, played with the software for myself, for, you know, for a couple of years. Gradually put together a sort of showreel or a portfolio of work. Um, and then I was lucky enough, um, after about two or three years, uh, there used to be Silicon Graphics, as was, or still is, but used to run a training facility in Soho Square. It doesn't exist anymore. But Houdini was just about being launched at that time. Um, it was just had been prisms, and it became what's now Houdini. And the UK distributor of that ran a, a competition. It was a kind, of, a kind of combination of a training course competition called the Houdini Challenge. This was a long time ago now. And, I still um, do it, actually, the side effects challenge, I think. The side effects, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I had a quick look on that. I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't quite find quite the same thing. But yeah, so the idea of this was that it was, um, it was a chance to go and use this training facility out of hours, um, get, get a chance to use Houdini on a you know, Silicon Graphics workstation, which was like a sort of dream thing back then, um, and, and produce a small piece of work. And the idea was that, that that work would then get shown. There was sort of 12 of us on the course or something. You know, you produce a little animation and it gets shown and they invited sort of an evening, I'm sure it's similar sort of things that happen here, you know, invite an evening and invite people from the industry along to come and view it. Um, so I spent uh, you know, several months doing a full-time job and then I'd come in the evening and sort of work ridiculous hours into the evening doing this thing. Anyway, that eventually got me, a, you know, I produced a little piece, which I won the thing, which was quite nice, I made a few contacts. And then I... Um, yeah, I just sort of managed to get in with uh, a new sort of startup company, so someone in the industry who'd been in the industry for a while, um, starting up a new small company, and I got in at the very beginning of that, which was a bit of a sort of baptism of fire, and pros and cons of, but uh, it certainly taught me a lot over a couple of years. Uh, and then eventually after that, I got a job at um, Henson's, Jim Henson's Creature Shop, which back then had a CG department. It doesn't anymore, but uh, that certainly went... <coughs> disappeared some years ago, but yeah. Okay, so both of you started out in smaller shops doing mm. commercials, TV stuff, that kind of thing. Do you think that's a good way for people to start a career? What, what are the sort of pros and cons of starting a career in a smaller shop as opposed to in a big company like Framestore? Yeah, uh, for me, what I like about starting as I did it, it's still really, um, you do a bit of everything actually, and for me it's a big difference uh, between what I've done first in commercial and after in movies. Movies is really more, uh, you need to choose a, like a, a category, if I can say this, about lighting or modeling or something like this. And yeah, it was a good opportunity for me at some point to start with something more generalistic, to have a better overview about what we can do or not. And it was easier after for me to make my choice basically yeah. uh, when I went to London and say, okay, I want to be lighter now because the path that I want to work with and uh, to make it good. So yeah, it's interesting to do this too. I have a good overview on everything. Yeah. Mm, no, I'd agree. I'd agree because when I, I mean, when I started, I just was doing a bit of everything, a bit of modelling, a bit of rigging, a bit of texturing, all the, the works. Um, when I went to Henson's, that was sort of focused it a bit more. So I sort of more on light, more on sort of TD, you know, TD type, technical director type work. So lighting, a bit of rigging, a bit of effects, that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, and then even when I started at Framestore back then, it was pre, you know, we're. The nature of the work these days, you know, we've got much, you have to become much more specialised, more departmentalised, but I think back then, and a bit like in commercials, my friend saying, you can be a bit more generalist, so you do a little bit of everything, and I think that's, yeah, I think it is very, very valuable to have that kind of overview of different different aspects of the, of the discipline, really. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I mean, I guess the cons are that the, kind of what you were describing, the turnaround of the work is so much faster that it's actually quite a stressful environment and that doesn't suit everyone. Um, yeah. And you, you don't ever get to completely finish your work either, or at least not to your satisfaction anyway. Yeah, you have to go fast, so you have to make a lot of compromise, basically. Yeah. And um, yeah, so it's good to, 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 to learn how to go fast and to deliver a first picture quickly. Yeah. But yeah, for me, it was a problem at some point. I was just frustrated, basically, to not finish the last 20% to make it perfect. Yeah. 
Um, so, coming up to date and, and your time at Framestore, um, what's been your favourite project that you've worked on at Framestore and why was it your favourite project? You want to yeah, go on, Carl. Yeah, okay. Um, actually, quite a small, relatively small project. Well, can I do my two? Mm -hmm. Yeah, all right. Okay. <laughs> I, I put two on the thing, I know it's cheap. He's worked for Framestore for a long time, so I figured two's okay. That's my, yeah, that's my yeah. yeah. Okay, so um, one of them was, was Golden Compass. And that was purely because I, you know, I'd read the books some years before, absolutely loved them, you know. And then when I heard there was going to be a film, I was obviously super excited. And then when I knew we were getting it, it was super, super excited. And then you found out how hard the work was. And yeah, you weren't then, super excited. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, be careful what you wish for. Yeah. Um, so that was, yeah, that was that was really exciting to to get to work on. And yeah, it was, as Amy is alluding to there, it was tough. It was actually a really hard show, but. It was that was sort of tempered by the fact that it was very exciting to be working on something that you kind of have a personal investment in, you know, as a story you love or whatever. And it was a bit similar with Harry Potter's as well, but for me it was particularly Golden Compass. And, and then also, we won our first Oscar for it. And that didn't hurt that we yeah. won the Oscar for it as well at the end. That kind of helped, you know, make all the all the pain and all the hard work worthwhile. Um, and it was also a project where, you know, just personally I felt I contributed quite a lot, sort of creative, creatively and on, on various levels too. So it was. It was a very satisfying project from that viewpoint. Um, and then the other one was much, a much smaller project, which was War Horse. Um, and again, you know, a lovely book, it was something I'd read, I'd loved. And let's be honest, it was Spielberg. So that's a you know, fairly clear-cut one. And you know, in, in the grand scheme of things, compared with a lot of other movies we've done, it was a much smaller job. But you know, the nature of the work, just trying to get Joey, the horse, you know, who just in a few key shots was fully CG, you know, and it was, the nature of that kind of work, it could never, you know, there was, no, there was no way you could get away with him looking even faintly CG. It had to be, it had to just sit seamlessly into it, as all our work does, but some things are more obviously, you know, a giant talking tree or a raccoon is you know, obviously CG, but, you know, th this had to be so sort of seamlessly integrated. And there's just a lovely, lovely shot that was just fantastic to be part of working on, and it was not, not just from, I don't mean from my role, but just seeing the whole how all the departments came together to produce one shot, which is just a seamless blend of switching between live action and CG and live action, and there's kind of classic sort of smoke and mirrors, sleight of hand, you know, when you switch between, and it was and beautiful animation, and just, just everything coming together. That was really good, that yeah. was, and really satisfying, and, yeah. and you know, for, for a really good client as well, let's face it, so, yeah. so that was fun. And what about you, Freddie? Um, but me, um, if I have to choose only one, clearly it's going to be Gravity. Of course, I can say this. Um, I spent two years and a half on this project, so I'm not going to lie. A few mornings, it was a bit difficult to go to work. <laughs> um, but for me, it was an amazing experience because first, uh, we started the show a bit differently than usually. When I say this, it's about the fact that we done the pre-light of the full movie first, and this was pretty new, uh, and it was long as well. I'm not going to lie again, and it was really interesting because I've been in contact directly with the DOP because his job basically was to prepare the set and everything for later. So it was a different kind of approach, if I can say this, but it was really interesting about this. And Framestore has been uh, amazing, if I can say this, because they gave us the opportunity to go on set after, to see what we've done, the hard work that we spend a lot of time to do. We have been the, on the set to see what was the, the lead cage and everything, to see what they are doing. So I had the opportunity to uh, meet uh, George Clooney. I mean, to see George Clooney. <laughs> <laughs> far away. Uh, we didn't talk, of course, because yeah, he was a bit shy and uh, embraced by, uh, by my work, so of course. Oh, obviously, yeah, yeah. Of course, or maybe the opposite, something like this. Uh, I met, um, I seen, of course, again, um, Sandra Bullock, and I saw uh, the director as well. And it was interesting to see things a bit on the other side of the computer, if I can say this, and to see how it works clearly on set. And uh, it's interesting to see what is the impact about our job, basically, and what we can do. And after, yeah, to finish the movie uh, the rest of the time, and uh, yeah, it was a big challenge because we had to know if we were even able to do it at the beginning. Over two years and a half, it's difficult to make clear plan about what you want to do. But it was really great, and of course, at the end, when we have the Oscar, yeah, you're really proud of it. So, yeah. it's really great. Okay. So, moving on to your department specifically now. So, can you describe a bit for each of your departments, and maybe we'll start with you this time, Freddie, just... Switch it up a bit. Um, can you describe what the balance is in your department between um, artistic skills and technical skills? Like, what, what's the sort of balance that you look for in people, and how does that play out in your department? 
It is a good question because for us it's clearly a good compromise between everything. The challenge in environment is to be able to do anything. So basically, uh, between theory, between what we can feel, between software, between possibilities, between what is happening in the world, out of frame store, ideas, how to think about how to build something, everything, we need to know uh, what's going on about technology, basically. But of course, it's just a tool at the end. Whatever you want to use as a software or anything else, you need to have the idea. And it's really about creativity. If you are able to do something beautiful, nobody cares how you did it at the end. And it's exactly the challenge of our department is to be able to make a good picture. We we'll find always a way to do it with software or whatever, but yeah, creativity is really, really the most important part for us. And what about you, Carl? It's sort of similar, really. I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about creativity. Yeah. But I mean, our, so Creature Effects is predominantly, if anyone doesn't know, Creature Effects is, is our, our, the bulk of our work is sort of dynamic simulation type work. So, you know, immediately that, that sounds fairly technical. And, you know, it is fairly technical. Um, so we're doing simulating cloth and hair and muscle and skin behavior, all that kind of secondary motion that you can't get from pure animation. Um, so it's sort of inherently technical on that level, but at the same time, you have to produce a nice, you still need the artistic, and you're not, let's be honest, you're not these days having to code that, you know, it's, you don't need that level of technical knowledge to do the kind of simulation work, you know, Maya has a cloth over in it, you know, it's not something you, 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 know, you have to sort of be able to code your way around. So, uh, yeah, I think, I think almost any discipline is going to have yeah. a pretty similar answer in, the, in that sort of balance of creativity and, 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 and you know, technical, technical side. So, I mean, maybe compared with some disciplines, it's a little more technical, but yeah. it's, a, it's a hard one. And it, it's, it's technical in the sense, I guess, of understanding, in, in both your cases, understanding the real world and understanding mm. the physics of the real world. So, you know, how does cloth behave when wind blows through it? And is that different if it's wool or if it's cotton yeah. or if it's whatever? It's those kind of technical understandings as opposed to, like you said, how to program a computer Exactly, as such. yeah. And yeah. It, 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 it all comes down to, yeah, and it's, it's observation, it's reference. You know, whenever you start a project, you're looking at that, you know, you've always got reference, either as reference of the, the, the live action actor that you're doing a digital double of or... If it's a compute, completely computer-generated creature, you, you, know, you find similar real-world you know, equivalents to that creature so that you can sort of base it on something, on something real. But, but also, more, more and more often, we're not just doing um, a, a recreation of, of natural behavior purely. So often these days, more and more, we're saying, right, well, okay, it has to look like cloth, it has to look like natural cloth, but it has to do this particular choreograph thing, whether it's a superhero's cape or... I was going to say, we're back to capes again. Oh, yeah. endless capes, yeah. I mean, these days, superheroes we, obviously are big. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they're from comic books, and in comic books, there are certain iconic poses, it's aren't there? About, where where yep. the cape's at a particular angle, and, you know, it has to be replicated. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So there's an awful lot of that kind of... Yeah, exactly, iconic is the word. Yeah. And that's, that's something that comes out time and time again, and, and more and more, it is about... You know, so much of our work is about... You know, even if you've got a character who's jumping from A to B, actually, if you looked at a real person jumping from A to B, their cloak might look rubbish in terms of, you know, aesthetically, whereas the director actually wants it to look really cool and flowing and billowing, even if that isn't what it might do in real life. You know? yeah. So it's, there's always that compromise between what is technically, yeah. you know, physically correct and just what looks cool and what is aesthetically pleasing, which at the end of the day is the more important thing. Because in, in simulation terms, it doesn't matter what you do to get results. Like Freddie said, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you have to get a nice result. It doesn't yeah. really matter how you achieve it. So if you're doing dynamic simulation, yes, you start with a concept of real world physics, maybe, faintly, but then you just you do what you do to get it to work. Yeah. And that's where the artistic side and the creativity and the sort of yeah, problem solving and natural thinking and all that sort of stuff comes in as well. So. And Freddie, do you want to, because environments I, I find anyway at all the visual effects companies mean slightly diff something slightly different and every mm. visual effects company does environments in a slightly different way so do you want to just describe briefly how environments works at Framestore and what that encompasses yeah um, I think the best way to, to describe this is to think like a DOP basically on set uh, before even to have any actors or whatever you start by build where we are okay what is going to be here the mountain here whatever we need and 
it's really like this. So we have to start by the camera. Okay, where the camera is going to be? Okay, it's there. So we need to build something here, actually. And this is why we need to think about concept, if you can say this, how to start to think what we are going to build before to build everything roughly everywhere. No, let's start to discuss what we expect to see with the client. And after, let's start to do a layout to build it. Let's start to put some texture to give a look, uh, then lighting with one, two sun sometimes. Uh, and we do everything from the beginning till the end. Of course, we have a strong crossover with other department to have a support because we can't do everything by ourselves. But basically, we drive the, from the beginning till the end, the full environment look and the picture. Cheers. Okay. Um, so, if someone was interested in a career in creature effects, mm -hmm. Uh, what should they be learning and what should they be doing um, at this stage to sort of start putting a portfolio together? Um, so, yeah, I think the, the, the founding thing would be some form of simulation work. You know, that's our sort of bread. You know, that's the bulk of our work is, is simulation based. So, you know, if you've got access to Maya and using Maya, then play around with NCloth, obviously. I mean, but that's what we use. Um, I mean, you know, certain companies use proprietary software for certain things. For cloth, we happen to use NCloth for all our cloth work. So any understanding you can get of that, that would be obviously extremely valuable. Um, for hair, we use NHair as well. We do use a combination of that and an in-house hair solver that we use for certain situations. Um, but even so, again, if you get an understanding of NHair, that would be good. Um, things like muscle systems, um, sort of skin slide concepts, things like that, that's also something you can play around with. You know, fairly freely in Maya. Again, we have our own proprietary versions of some of those things, it has to be said, but a lot of it is about just developing the idea of the concepts behind it. You know, the, at the end of the day, the sort of parameters that you need to change in a cloth solver or a hair solver are fairly kind of universal, doesn't matter exactly which piece of software you're using, they're broadly the same concepts of damping, you know, drag, air resistance, gravity, all these sort of things. So it's just getting familiar with the concept of simulation as well. But always just bear in mind that the, the aesthetic side as well. You know, if you're doing something, make it look pretty as well as just natural. You know. And do you prefer to see, because um, a, a lot of people uh, send us reels that have sort of feature animation style mm -hmm. works, you know, Pixar inspired or whatever. Yeah. Do you mind seeing that kind of work or do you prefer to see sort of more real-world examples? I think it depends. I, mean, I think the good thing that that sort of thing shows is often is a sort of teamwork approach because those things are often a project-based thing. Um, so it shows, you know, if you, as long as you make clear which aspects you've been involved in. Um, I think at the end of the day, it's down to showing a nice piece of work, not necessarily a long piece of work. I think that's the thing maybe with doing like a short or something, it can often be quite long, yeah. you know, and I think the thing which I think almost anyone will say about reels and about work you should put on it is put your very best stuff, the stuff you're most proud of on there, and, you know, quantity, quality. Start with the Y, yeah. <laughs> yeah, quality is always better than quantity, so... Um, uh, if you've got a really fantastic short little animation and everything's great, otherwise show a yeah, little clips of, clips it. of yeah. it. Yeah, I, I think in the real world, people who are looking at reels, you know, it's just worth bearing in mind that everyone is everyone is busy, everyone is seeing an awful lot of reels, and I think it's that old that old adage about yeah, just yeah. just you need to catch you know, first impressions and all that sort of thing. So yeah. focus on what you want to show and just show something nice of that. And you, Freddie, if someone was interested in getting into environments, what should they be doing? What should they be learning? What should they be looking at? Yeah, I think maybe my first advice would be just go out and open your eyes, basically, and have a look around you. Try to give a sense uh, on the world around you, basically, what is beautiful, what this means really. You know, for example, we have a good the sun, for example, in the street. Why the colors are different, try to turn around, try to understand, try to give a sense. I think it's the best thing that we can do for us in environment is to identify what is important in the, in the picture at the end. And after, you can try yourself with Photoshop or whatever to try to mix this kind of elements to, yeah, to give a sense again, but it's going to be your world, if I can say this. So I think it's more important to spend time 
by observing what is around us than to try by yourself without any references, basically. Yeah. And any particular softwares or anything that you're looking for particularly? Yeah, um, yeah, it could be Maya, it could be Photoshop, it could be a lot of things, but so on the same page, it's better to have few things, but really good, uh, than to see always the same kind of shots from all the other companies, basically. So it's good to have even, yeah, a simple test, a personal project or whatever, where we can see what you have in mind, what you want to do, who you are, basically. I think this is more important at some point than really to focus on one software or to show the same shot like everyone in this industry. And, and what about a mix between, because obviously environments can be natural environments, but they can also be built environments like cities and what have you. Do you have a preference between the two? Do you like to see a mix of both? Could be a bit of everything, huh? because uh, when I remember what we've done on Guardian of the Galaxy, basically it was something like, it was a favela from Brazil that we have to put, uh, to put in the skull. So, yeah, this kind of idea that I like, it's, yeah, we use something existing, but we are trying to do it differently and to show it differently. I think it's this the key, basically, to, to show who you are and what you want and uh, what is your potential. Basically. If you could go back and give yourself one piece of advice when you were studying, really? what would it be? As the first one would be uh, work your English at school. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be the first one. Uh, but if not, I, I think I will say, don't give up, um, because I think when we start uh, this in this industry, we can have a lot of doubts, like uh, this evening, this discussion between artistic, technical. I think we are not by default artistic or technical. It's just about time, just about what you want to do, what you expect to do in your life. So I think yeah, my main advice would be don't give up. Do whatever you feel, what you want to do and where you want to go. Okay, and what about you, yeah, Carl? Well, yeah, I, I, with, with the hindsight, I'd probably <laughs> just follow the advice I gave just now about, you know, pruning down your work and, you know, when you're, when you're submitting something and sending out a portfolio or a showreel, just, just trim it down, you know, yeah. yeah. Just leave off those embarrassing <laughs> bits that you really look back and wish you hadn't put on. We, we, are, we are a cynical bunch, I'm afraid, <laughs> yes, and, and generally we will assume that the worst piece on your reel is the best you can do, not the best piece on your reel. So bear that in mind, because we'll assume the best piece was a fluke, right? That was, that, that was a fluke. So bear that in mind. Uh, that's, that's how we're judging you, is very cynically, I'm afraid. Um, okay, and then final question for me, and then I'm gonna let these guys um, jump in. And that is, what do you see um, the next big challenge or the next big technological advancement or what the next big change in your department to be? Look at their faces. Yeah. They're thrilled with that question. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this one. Very well. So, um, I think now with the virtual reality that we can see everywhere, even on phone, in a box or whatever, um, I think for us the biggest challenge is going to be this, is going to be able to do um, an environment but on 360 basically, not only on the one camera view, but yet to create a full world. I think it's going to be our next challenge yeah. soon. And one that people can potentially interact with as well. Don't go too far. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it could be, but at least yeah. if the person is free to have a look, yeah, yeah. it's going to be a nightmare. But we'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's the disadvantage of letting someone go first. That was sort of mine as well. <laughs> because, yeah, you can't hide in a 360 environment like that. You know, a lot of stuff, and this isn't just creature effects at any department. Yeah. You know, you can hide stuff from camera. If it's not visible, <laughs> then it doesn't matter if it doesn't work. You know? yeah. That little piece of cloth is knotting up At out, of, out of view. <laughs> no one's going to care, but if they can yeah. walk around behind it, then yeah. they are. Um, but to, to give something original, then, I think it's, I think it's just coming up with... <sighs> smarter ways to just turn stuff around quicker because as yeah. anyone in the industry will say the deadlines are getting you know, tighter and tighter there's expectations arising all the time deadlines are going you know, getting tighter and tighter and i think it's just finding smart ways to be able to to sort of think on your feet and, and turn turn around changes yeah. and, and updates and yeah. things quicker because that's kind of what it's all about at the end of the day efficiencies the buzzword yeah. of the day yeah, yeah. Okay, um, Manny, are we going to be able to take online questions as well? Yeah, I've got a few for you already, actually. Okay, great. Well, why don't, why don't we jump in with a few of those? The question was, on a tracking or match move reel, um, obviously you've got plates, you've got tracking markers, um, and you've also got the, the track itself, a final shot. 
um, but should the person include geometry on their tracking reel as well? Um, and the answer to that question is yes, absolutely. Um, it's really good to see um, someone's placement and someone's geometry. Um, I also think on a tracking reel, um, for us certainly at Framestore, and it's, it's not the case in every company, but at Framestore, um, tracking isn't a career department. Um, it's a department that generally people start in and then they might move on to something else. So I think it's good to include either at the end of your tracking reel or maybe as a separate reel, you know, if you've got a Vimeo channel, have another reel that, that shows some of your other work and shows what it is you're potentially interested in doing after being a tracker. Um, because it's good to see and it's good for us to know what someone's thinking in terms of their progression and where they're at um, with those other skills as well. So I think that's important to show too. How do you get experience if you can't get an internship or work experience or if you can't get your foot in the door basically? Um, it's a very good question. I know it's a bit of a catch-22 sometimes. Um, I think there are several ways though. I think um, most of you are part of a community. You've got people you've studied with or you've got people you know online or through doing competitions or whatever. Um, so go and make projects. Um, I, I don't think enough people just go and make stuff and experiment and see what happens. Um, it's really good experience. It shows you can work in a team. It shows you've got ideas. Um, it shows you're, you're willing to persevere and keep trying. And so I think that's definitely one way. I think um, another thing, which is what we were discussing at the start, while obviously at Framestore we would love to employ every talented student slash graduate out there, we're only you know, a finite size, as are all the companies. Um, so try, try the smaller companies, try related companies, try architectural visualization, try medical imaging, try, um, you know, they do CG recreations of crime scenes now. Like there's all sorts of ways you can apply as, as your skills and get some experience that's relevant, that shows again, you can work to deadlines, you can deliver work to a quality that someone else is directing. You know, these are the things we're looking for when we say experience. Um, so don't just limit yourself, oh, well, Framestore, DNAG, and MPC said no, so that's it, you know, I'm out. Um, you know, try, try as many places as you can and, to get that foot in the door. So that was, um, what do we think about when designing a new character uh, concept? I mean, as is so much of the, the work that we do, it's very much a team-based thing, so in, you know, the concept... It's tricky, so often the client will provide um, an initial design for a character, or it can come from several ways. Sometimes we might be asked by the client to come up with the design for a character, um, and then that we have our own art department, incredibly amazing and talented art department yeah. at Framestore. Um, and so sometimes the work can come through that way, sometimes there is a very, very clear guide from the client, they might have a, a, a maquette, you know, a physical model, that's been scanned. So, I mean, the design process can come from a, from a whole host of ways. Um, but if you are looking at, uh, you know, if you're involved in the creative aspect of that, um, a lot of it comes down to, which is something that, both, that we both sort of referred to this evening, which is looking for real world examples. Yeah. So, however, you know, even if you're designing uh, a relatively outlandish kind of creature, it probably has some you know, comparison to a real world creature of some sort. So whether it's the quality of the skin or the fur or, or you know, having some concept of the underlying musculature and skeleton of, of that creature, it's that kind of stuff. It's all about grounding it in the real world, you know, because at the end of the day, we're so used to seeing real things and real animals and real people that, you know, your, your eyes are attuned to things that just somehow look off. So unless you're deliberately designing something that's very kind of out there and deliberately stylized, if you're trying to go for kind of naturalistic effects, then yeah, try and find real world examples to sort of support your design and you know, make it more believable. Okay, so should we take some questions out here for a change now? <coughs> Anyone have anything they want to ask? Um, yeah, so there's um, the animating creature. Yeah. Um, how to do the uh, fur dynamics? Uh, would I be able to do that? Would I have to, like, I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I get what you're asking. I get what you're asking. Um, do you want me to hmm. say that? Or do you want to say that? Are you meaning from your, the work you're doing yourself? Are you? Uh, well, let's say I get no, to frame uh, store. Yeah. yeah. I'm doing oh, I see. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, no, I mean those are two distinct disciplines, oh. really. Um, 
So yeah, animation is a very distinct discipline, frame store. I mean, there are, there are a number of areas of frame store that kind of cross over. So I mean, animation is distinct, <laughs> but you know, there is crossover with work we do in creature effects because sometimes, the, like I was talking about earlier, the very sort of choreographed simulation is often a collaboration between animation and creature effects. And also rigging as well is a collaboration, you know, when we're doing creature musculature and skin, that's a collaboration between rigging and creature effects and potentially animations. But the basic answer is those are, those within the frame store concept of things, those are two distinct things. At a smaller company, and maybe, if, or if you're working in commercials, you might get a chance to do all that. I mean, because that's, as Amy said earlier, you know, if you work in a, if you get that kind of smaller initial startup thing, you know, where you're doing a bit of everything, you're in commercials, whatever, you can, you know, that's quite fun. You can dabble in all sorts. You might rig, the, you might model the creature, rig it, animate it, and you know, stick some fur on at the end. Potentially, you yep. know, but that's again, it's sort of like scale. The bigger the company, the bigger the projects that you work on, the less likely you would be able to do those two things that you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. and we do have a few people who uh, move between departments. Um, so, you know, we have a few modelers, for example, who can texture really well as well. But because of the way schedules work on these big films, um, they won't generally model an asset and texture that same asset. Generally, they will model a bunch of stuff, whatever that happens to be, and then when modeling is getting quiet, because they've delivered everything for that round of shows, they will then move to the texturing department and pick up whatever texturing work needs doing. And that may be on the assets they've modeled, but it may be on entirely different assets. It may be on an entirely different shows, the one they've been modeling on. So, um, you know, there are people who sort of move between, but it, you generally won't see an asset all the way through yourself um, because, you know, as Carl was saying, we're just too big and the shows are too complex for, for that to be able to happen, unfortunately. Um, but it does happen on the, the commercial side of the business. So, any other questions? Uh, we'll go over the back and then we'll come back. Hi, um, being a compositor, we just make this thing is incredible. Like, it's just a lot of work Um, so I don't know if that would have got picked up online. So the question was, as a compositor, is it more important to be technical or artistic? Um, actually, interesting with, interestingly with compositing, um, it really varies from compositor to compositor. I would say probably if you spoke to our head of compositing, he would say it was very much more an artistic pursuit. I, I think that's how he would describe it, it's very much as an artistic role, because ultimately you are responsible for that final image. Um, you know, whether that final image looks good or not, you're the last person who's going to touch it, apart from the grader who's going to make it all black and then you won't be able to see it anyway, but we'll leave that aside. <laughs> Generally, you're the last person who's going to touch yeah. it. Um, so, you know, if, if, you know, Joe Public are going to buy that image, that's down to you, really. So, um, but having said that, um, there are compositors out there who are incredibly technical yeah. and they write a lot of tools to help the compositing workflow. Um, they uh, make efficiencies in a lot of the automated tasks in compositing. Um, so there's certainly a space for both, um, but I think overall as a pursuit, it, it is more artistic. Um, and you know, an understanding of photography, and understanding of cameras, how real world cameras work is so important to that department, so. You agree? No, I agree. Uh, after, yeah, now with the new um, compositing software, it's more and more technical. You can do even 3D lighting, all this kind of thing. So, yeah, the technical part is maybe more important day after day, but it's always to serve the quality and the artistic side. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so she was saying that generally you start as a compositor by starting in Paint and Roto, which is largely a technical pursuit. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think that's right. Um, you know, Paint and Rotor is largely a technical thing. But what it's about, Paint and Rotor, and the reason that so many companies say this is where you should start, is because it's about understanding the source material. It's about really understanding what it is you are getting delivered from set and how that works and how practical photography works um, in relation to CG. Um, and that is so crucial and underpinning to what the compositor does. Um, you know, most of our compositors at Framestore at least, and again, it's different at smaller studios, but at Framestore, most of our compositors don't do their own paint and roto. 
So as a compositor, they are focusing on the artistic, but they have gone through that technical underpinning knowledge first. Um, so they've, they've given themselves that foundation to then pursue the real sort of creative side of the, the role. Um, so that's, that's why um, we feel it's important that they really understand that material that's coming in from set. Are there any sort of collaboration between just the effects department and the virtual effects department and what they consist in? Um, there can be, yes. I mean, that's a very project-dependent question, I think. So, I mean, yes, I mean, broadly speaking, effects and creature effects technically are often using, you know, could be using similar software. Um, you know, we're using solvers within Maya. So, yes, in, in a sense, it's very similar territory. In practice, possibly less than you might think, I would say. I mean, so to, to anyone who's, who's not sure, you know, classic effects work, taken in a broad, sort of overall term, is going to be your explosions, fluids, fire, you know, dust, that, smoke. dust, any of yeah. that kind of yeah, big effects stuff. <laughs> well, yeah. That was very specific. It was, well, thank you. Uh, and and you'll be pleased. It's a very yeah. technical term. <laughs> yeah, yeah, technical effects will thank me for that. Um, whereas, yeah, whereas our stuff, yeah, it's more creature. So it's, it's creature and character based. Yes, it's great, isn't it? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your encouraging laughter. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, can, like I can't think though, Yeah, yeah, thanks. What about things One, like, okay, well, What about things like, for example, uh, a vehicle, let's say a car, bonnet, uh, that something gets dropped onto and it mm -hmm. deforms? Yep. Quite often that's done with a cloth. Solve, right? It is. It is. So, where would that fall? No, that would that's probably fall with us, but then, you know, it gets into complex territory. It could go, it could go through modelling. You know, we could run, there have been cases where, for example, modelling might pick up a bit of simulation software, or we might give them, we might do a bit of simulation to do, for the example you give, I think that was used on gravity for like buckled surfaces. You know, you could run a cloth sim with a high rigidity cloth to give a kind of metal or you know, whatever buckled effect. And that could, yeah, that could get given to rigging, could get given to modelling, animation. It could be a face. I'm just trying to think in practical terms. One of the ones that was on the reel that was, uh, would have been a collaboration would have been the Dracula work. Yep. Um, where there was a lot of sort of fragmenting. I don't know if you recall the sequences or if you've seen the film, the Dracula Untold. Untold, yeah. Whatever it um, <laughs> whatever. Sorry, whatever it got called in the end. It went through so many name changes. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Um, but that was a very um, sort of interesting mixture of classic effects type work, which is particles and you know explosive elements and things flying off, and sort of more classic character creature kind of cloth work. And that went through. That was uh, that went through a kind of hybrid pipeline. Also on that reel, um, if anyone saw 47 Ronin, the work with the, the Tengu monks who were these kind of yellow robed characters and they were kind of moving in this kind of, sort of bullet time kind of concept. That work went through a, a quite involved creature effects and effects process because there was all sorts of stuff to do with sort of retiming, creating cloth volumes, passing those cloth volumes to effects to create kind of elements driven off the cloth and then passing it back. So, I mean, yes, yeah, there can be, but it's not, I wouldn't say it's our day-to-day -day work, we're not working closely, but on certain projects, then yeah, we, we, we kind of intermesh really, really quite but closely. So. There is another studio that I won't name because I'm not here to do their marketing <laughs> for them, um, but there, there is another studio where actually they don't have effects and creature effects, yeah. they have rigid body effects and soft body effects, and that's how they split it up. So. And, the, and the, literally, that's how they make the division. So, you know, there are other companies that do it a different way to us, um, but that, that's just how we decide to split it up, so. Regarding R&D, uh, as you know, there is a close relationship between programming and R&D. Uh, and I want to know, uh, what do you suggest me to learn computer programming, C++, Python? Which language do you suggest me to learn? Okay, so we actually have a number of software departments at Framestore, and they each, sorry, so the question for people online was, uh, if someone was interested in R&D, what kind of programming language should they learn? Um, so yeah, we have a number of software departments, so I just want to make sure, I'm going to run through them briefly, just to make sure you do mean R&D, because again, it's one of those things that means something different at every studio. 
Um, so at Framestore R&D are the ones who basically build our proprietary softwares. So the things and our big proprietary tools. So the things that Carl was describing. So our proprietary muscle system, our proprietary water simulation uh, software, those sorts of things. That's what R&D look after. And largely they're writing in C++. Mm. Um, we then have our pipeline team. So our pipeline team are the ones who are responsible for, as the name suggests, the workflow essentially. So they're the ones who are responsible for making sure that all of the artists can work together, that things get passed along correctly, that things get out for review correctly, that you know everything gets managed, version control gets managed, all that kind of stuff. Um, so they're largely writing in Python. Um, so they're generally taking what R&D have done and then trying to wrap it up and make it work for the artists. So they're generally writing in Python. Um, we've then got our production tools team. Um, so they write tools, as it suggests, for the production team. So to make sure that the production team can get from the pipeline what's happening with everything, where everything's at, what artist has done what, when, who's supposed to be doing what, when. Um, so production tools write tools for them. They're also largely writing in Python, but they also do a lot of user interface stuff. So, um, and actually both pipeline and production tools will do some database work as well with Postgres um, and that kind of thing. So, and some SQL. Um, and then we have other sort of software people dotted around. So we have what we call our assistant technical directors. Um, so they are a small department that report directly to our head of CG and they are basically the people who problem solve on shows. Um, so obviously we have a lot of people who are um, very artistic and not technical at all um, and when something goes wrong quite often they don't know how to fix it if it's you know, something that's gone wrong with their render or with the software or with something that's been passed to them or whatever. Um, so the ATDs are there to help them problem solve that stuff and try and fix it. They're also there to help write um, show specific tools. So if there's something that comes up on a particular show that's never going to be needed again, it's not something that's going to come up on show after show after show, it just needs a quick fix to get it out for that show. The ATDs might help write that. Um, sometimes it may turn out that tool has other applications that are, are useful to other shows, in which case it will be passed to pipeline and they will try and clean that up and make it something that can be rolled into the core infrastructure. So it, it does depend. Um, but the ATDs are largely writing in Python as well. And then we have um, various people out on the floor in the departments who are technical themselves and they enjoy writing little bits of code that help them with things or help their colleagues with things. And again, that's largely in Python. So most people are writing in Python. The only department really that's different is core R&D and they're writing in C++. Was that good answer? No, it's perfect. I'm okay. impressed. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really good. He was giving me a weird look. I was like, did I say something wrong? No, no, no. <laughs> Okay, yes, you've been waiting patiently. <laughs> so I, I imagine the answer to my question can vary from, from like the company to the project, but basically I feel like the visual effects uh, industry has a pretty bad reputation for the hours, so like working hours. So like, especially being a student, you get told like, oh yeah, you won't have time for anything else, this is going to be your life, don't get into relationships with anything. <laughs> 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 it's pretty true. Would you say that is true in reality, like when you work? Like, <laughs> 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 I have to go so easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yes, again, if we start in... <laughs> Wait, don't say yes. No. <laughs> when, when I say yes, it's because we started uh, with this topic, actually, uh, this evening. Oh, sorry. Um, basically, is your life is going to be only at work if you work in the VFX. Uh, so I understand this point of view, and I think it could be the case, could be, if you are in commercial, mainly, because you are always to deliver quickly. After, of course, the goal is not to do this at all, and I think we are clearly, clearly better than a few years ago about this and uh, mainly now in movie uh, we are really really able to handle this correctly and to make it good of course if you spend your day on facebook yeah maybe you will have to stay a bit later on the evening <laughs> but usually we are trying to give tasks that you can do over the day so it's not the goal at all of course maybe at the end when we need to push a bit to deliver this can happen but it should be really really a uh, few times not more 
in our in our Montreal office they have to fill out and Montreal only does film work. Um, they have to fill out timesheets because yeah. it's the law there. Um, so we have we know what hours are being worked in our Montreal office in a way we don't so much in our London office because it's not a culture here to do timesheets. Um, and in Montreal last year, and bear in mind there's 300 of them there now, um, the average amount of overtime worked was um, 32, uh, wait, no, that's all right, yeah, 32 hours in a year. Oh. Yeah, it's not very much. And the, okay, that's an average, so some people work more than that and some people didn't work any at all. Um, but it wasn't a huge amount. So, you know, we do, as Freddie said, we do try to manage it. There are shows that turn into a nightmare, um, and largely that's out of our control. Um, but, yeah, it, generally it's, not, it's no. not anywhere like it used to be at all. Oh, it's God. managed a lot better. Um, and, yeah, we do encourage people to have a life. You know, that's a question. <laughs> that, 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 that is important to people, we understand that. <laughs> Life, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's important. Even about gravity yeah. again, if you yeah. spend your time at work at some point, you are useless, to be honest. So yeah. it's good to have your time to be fresh and to come back and to be able to work basically. Yeah, correctly. and and to bring new ideas yeah. to the table. You know, if we're talking about being yeah. creative, exactly. how can you be creative if you're sat at your desk for 18 hours a day? You're not possibly being creative at that point. So the question was is Houdini worth using or worth learning sorry not worth using worth learning sorry side effects that was what I meant um, don't kill me um, uh, yes Houdini is definitely worth learning so at uh, Framestore the only department really well our commercials team use Houdini quite a lot actually um, that's one of the core parts of their pipeline down in commercials um, on the film side the only department that really uses Houdini is our effects department um, and they, but they don't use a huge amount of it actually at Framestore. They largely use Maya and our proprietary tools that are built within Maya. Um, but they do use Houdini for certain things, particularly um, sort of one-off effects, like magical effects and things like that, because it's quite good at that kind of thing. Um, but uh, I know a lot of the other companies use Houdini a lot more extensively than we do at Framestore. Um, so it's definitely worth learning from that perspective um, and you know as these guys have both said ultimately softwares are tools yeah. and really it doesn't matter what you've learned um, because a lot of the same principles apply yeah. so there's that aspect as well I would say don't actually the worst thing you can do is become a software fanatic so you know to turn up in an interview and say i only use houdini or i only use maya because i love it and it's the best that's actually the worst thing you can do being flexible and open to learning new software is actually the best thing yeah. so yeah and actually one good thing about houdini I mean, we don't use it at all but um the, the, the sort of node for those who are familiar with houdini the very kind of node based procedural mm. nature of houdini actually teaches you, you know, gets you into a certain mindset, which you can still use in, you know, we have another completely in-house proprietary system that actually it's just to do with helping us automate and run certain processes. But it's interesting to see those people who know Houdini, their eyes light up when they see it. You know, it bears no relation to Houdini, but it has some of the same, you know, the same mindset and the same yeah. concept behind it. So all these things, you know, can come back and be useful in ways that you might not expect. So, yeah. So the question for those who didn't hear it was Brexit. Someone, <laughs> someone opened that can of worms. Um, okay, so the good news first. The good news is that so far Brexit hasn't impacted us at all. And in fact, if it has had any impact, it's had a positive impact because the pound has done this. And so all the American studios are rubbing their hands together and thinking how cheap we are to send work to. So, um, so in that sense, so far it's been nothing but positive. Um, obviously, at some point, they will address the free flow of people around the EU and what they plan to do about that. Um, at the moment, there's no indication of what that might be, really. So we don't know any more than anyone else knows. Um, but, you know, as an industry, we've um, the UK Screen Association, who is the sort of trade body for um, visual effects and post-production, did a little survey. 26% of the London community is from the EU, um, from outside the UK EU. Um, 
So that's obviously quite a lot of people. We are not the only industry that's in that situation. I was watching the news this morning and uh, I think it was the manufacturing industry and they were saying, yeah, over 30% of the, their staff are EU as well. Um, so, you know, I, I think they would be very foolish to just go, right, that's it, off you all go. Uh, because I think, frankly, our economy would just collapse overnight. <laughs> um, so I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think we're going to be packing Freddie off with his yeah. uh, little stick with a bag on the back. Um, so, no, I, I, think, I don't think we're going to have a problem. We're certainly not reducing our hiring from the EU or not considering EU applicants or anything ridiculous like that. We're carrying on business as normal until we know more, um, to be honest with you. Um, and, you know, all of those people like Freddie who have been here a long time, we're helping them to get their permanent residency so that if anything crazy happens, they're, you know, they're free to stay for as long as they want to stay and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, our EU talent is very important to us and we have no intention of just letting it wander away at the whims of the government. So... Oh, All right. Ready? Amy, thank you very much. Thank you very much.